Hey guys, Prompt here. In the next series of videos, I'm going to be challenging myself to teach an entire undergraduate chemistry course by myself as a first year undergrad from UBC. Watch the end to find out how it goes. Let's get to it. So the course I'm going to be teaching is one of my favorites, Chem 123. It's a mix and match of thermodynamics, kinetics, and introductory organic chemistry. And in the spirit of mixing and matching disciplines on this channel, this looks like a really fun place to start teaching for me. However, as with all things, I think there's always room for improvement, and a way to make it more fun and entertaining. Okay, so having heard that this course is split into three separate areas of chemistry, it sounds really, really daunting. However, I'm here to tell you that it's not as daunting as you may have thought, and that they aren't as separate as you may have initially thought. To chemists, these three fields tell you things about how a chemical reaction happens. Thermodynamics tells you whether a reaction can happen and the price you pay for it. Kinetics is all about the speed of your reaction and the ways you can control it. And last but not least, organic chemistry tells you what exactly is reacting and how you can control the reaction. And as a taste of what's to come, let's see what this trinity looks like in action. And by the end of this video, Hopefully you walk away looking at this trinity in a different light. We're going to be looking at what can only be called the Wright Brothers moment for chemistry, the invention of molecular motors. In the 1900s, it's always been a child's dream to soar above the skies as if we were birds. The engineering of nature is truly magnificent, so much so that people thought the Wright Brothers were insane. Nowadays, we take flying from place to place for granted. However, I'd argue that this is merely scratching the surface of the potential that nature holds. As biologists of the past look closer and closer, they find a bird is made up of cells, and cells are made up of organelles, and organelles are made up of biomolecules. And these molecules aren't as static as many of us have been led to believe. They move in complicated and fascinating ways, they break apart, they rebuild, and they can even replicate themselves without any real outside intervention. Ultimately, it's these abilities of biomolecules that make life what it is. And being the crazy scientists that we are, we ask ourselves, what if, what if we can harness that power for ourselves? And there are many fields of science that try to do this. Some study the molecules, Others try to have existing systems be manipulated to our liking. But the one I'd like to shine light upon is the one where you try to build your own version of these molecular machines. Specifically, let's say you're a scientist in the late 20th century, trying to replicate how molecules store information. In our eyes, we have retinol, a molecule that turns on when it's hit by light transmit the signal to our brains and shuts down after a while when the lights go out. This act of turning on and off can be viewed, in fact, as a form of short-term memory, and you want it to access and harness this ability outside of your eyes. This all works because of the nature of light and double bond, something we'll definitely touch on in this course. One problem you'll definitely encounter is that if you take the molecule out of its environment, its natural environment, it doesn't work anymore. So you're trying to explore different variations of this problem, adding chemical groups onto double bonds and sometimes taking some groups away. Each time earning you different interesting results, some being interesting and some not so much. Until perhaps by chance, you end up synthesizing this molecule. Not only does it flip between on and off, but one peculiar property that it has is that it can rotate around itself. That's amazing. Back in the day, no one had ever made something like this before. But there's a problem with this molecule. It's just that though it rotates, it takes an hour to complete one revolution. To fix this problem, you take a deeper dive into how this molecule works. And one of the ways that you tried to do that was by abstracting the stages of rotation in terms of energy. The molecule can't just rotate on its own. It needs to break the double bond so that it can swivel to the next stage. And by breaking that bond, 
that requires energy, represented by this hill here. You can't cross the hill without applying energy. This is thermodynamics in action right here. It's telling you that this reaction can't happen for free, and you'll have to pay energy for it to happen. And in this case, the energy comes from light. But to continue from stage 2 to stage 3, you can see that this molecule is kind of blocking itself, so it does need a small boost to push forward. And that can be done by heating the molecule to 20 degrees Celsius. And then the reverse step is pretty much similar with an excitation and heating of its own. However, this thermal step here is the main problem of the motor, the part where it makes it really slow. This is where kinetics comes into play. You try to modify the speed of this reaction. And so you think to yourself, hmm, since it needs to climb this hill to go to the next stage, is there a way to somehow make this hill smaller? This energy hill does have a lot of contributing factors to it, but one of them has to do with the pushing back between the two parts of the motor. So why don't we just design a motor that doesn't do this as much while keeping its functionality? And so after many, many iterations and modifications, you managed to turn this motor from rotating once an hour to once in nanoseconds. This is what kinetics is all about modifying the reaction setup or the molecule itself so that the rate of the reaction is manipulated to your liking. Isn't that awesome? And of course, it's even more reassuring that this story I'm telling you here is based off the Dutch chemist Ben Feringa's story. And he did went ahead and win the 2016 Chemistry Nobel Prize for his and his lab discovery. That was quite the story, isn't it? But it's also healthy to take a step back and just ask yourself, why invent these motors? Well, my answer to that is that this is like the whole Wright Brothers situation. No one knew that the invention of airplanes would lead to us casually going on Boeing 747s these days. And that's one of the beauties of science. It's that none of this was targeted for any real applications. Scientists just saw living things and they just went like, well, that looks interesting, and it certainly looks like fun to them to try to replicate. And even though this was all targeted for fun and games, try as they might, you can see there are a bunch of applications for molecular motors reaching into fields such as medicine, digital displays, and even more crazy, they made a nano drill that can puncture cells like cancer cells off of this motor. And that's ultimately why I want you to take away from this course. I want you to get all excited about all the applications, no matter how cutting edge, like nanomotors, or something as normal and everyday life as the engineering behind aspirin pills. But after that, hook you into staying to catch a glimpse of the process of innovation and discovery conducted by scientists everywhere in the world. And that it might be you who could change the world by just having fun and discovering new things and learning new things. This is going to be Chem 123. I hope you have fun. See you in the first and second video out right now, along with this video. And there's going to be 13 more of these to come. Don't forget to like and subscribe. This is Prompt, signing off.